this is a garden trug. Uh, it looks rather old and dilapidated this one, but I've had this one 25 years. So that says something about the durability of a basket like this. And it's ideal for just for putting your bits and pieces in when you're gardening, you know, trowel and secateurs and gloves and a bottle of beer on a day like today. The trugs that you've come to see, if I just go through basically the materials that are used, um, the, uh, the rim and the handle uh, are generally made of sweet chestnut. Um, but uh, you experts that are probably watching will think, well, that's not sweet chestnut, that's ash. And that is quite correct. This is, in fact, made of ash. And years ago, when I started making these, I did the rim and the handle in ash because I had plenty of ash growing in the uh, field next door. Um, but sweet chestnut is a far better material. But it means going down to Sussex in order to collect it. Uh, the boards are local grown willow and uh, so they've been harvested off uh, what we call crack willow trees, Salix fragilis, and um, from poles that are about 12 years old and then split down to make the boards. Um, this drug really ought to be, you know, ought to be thrown out because it's getting a bit past it, but it's one of the first ones I ever made and so it's a sort of sentimental value this one. Uh, but the ones I produce now are a little tidier, a little bit more marketable, and uh, are looking like this. Now, the rim and the handle on that uh, are sweet chestnut, and uh, the boards are again willow. This is what's known as a two gallon trug, um, because that's a sort of volume, dry volume it would hold. And um, it's not an exact measurement, but that's just approximate. It's about 24 inches long and the next size up that I make is a four gallon one and this is the four gallon um, but you'll probably notice that the two gallon one has got feet or stands whereas the four gallon one have, has got these straps uh, which tend to support the length of the basket because these boards are getting rather long so the bigger ones are strapped whereas the smaller ones have stands or feet I do, I do make the little ones as well, the sort of little children's trug that they can go and collect eggs in. Or um, A lot of people use them for different purposes. Um, I, I took one to a, a lady in Stratford-on-Avon a week or two ago and she said, oh, it's just right for harvest festival uh, to put the, uh, uh, the fruit and the vegetables in. And also she said, oh, for Mothering Sunday we can put all the flowers in it, we're going to give the children and not that many people actually go and get them full of soil in the garden as they were probably intended because they, uh, they like to keep them more ornamental. Uh, as regards preserving them, a little bit of cuprinol from time to time is not a bad thing because uh, uh, after 25 years the odd woodworm will probably find them as they have in the bottom of this one and the uh, little rascals. So uh, I tend to use a mixture of cuprinol, turpentine and um, uh, just to soak into the wood and perhaps a bit of linseed oil as well and that uh, um, keeps them for a few more years. Right well we'll, we'll go off down to the workshop Bert's barn and uh, I'll show you how these trucks are made. It's lovely to be able to work outside. Right now what we've got here uh, this device is what is known as a cleaving brake and it's a, a device which helps you split wood down because what we've got to do is go from round poles of sweet chestnut and willow down to thinner strips that can be used with the rims and handles and the boards of the trug and most of the splitting work is done on this device. This is a piece of sweet chestnut that will make uh, a handle or several handles um, Another piece there, these are about 12 years old. I can tell that by counting the rings, it's all very clever stuff. And uh, these came from Sussex, down near Battle, Hastings Way. I've got a, a, a young man there who spends his winter cutting sweet chestnut and selling it for steak making and um, truck making. So I had to go all the way down to Sussex for the sweet chestnut. We get, it likes sandy soil doesn't like it in the in the heavy clay of the Midlands. 
Uh, and the other material we need is willow. And this is of similar sort of age, about 12 years. Uh, this piece of willow uh, has got to be split down, as I said, on this cleaving break into uh, thin boards of about uh, three, three, four millimetres thick, about eight to an inch, a little bit thicker. Uh, so um, that can be quite tedious and uh, it's not that easy, especially if you've got a few branches sticking out. Uh, this pole, only half of it will be useful. Well, it, um, on the side that hasn't got the branches. Anyway, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So that's the, that's the willow for the boards. But what I'm doing is showing you the traditional way that Thomas Smith would have made a trug uh, in 1829. So it's placed in the cleaving brake and we use this tool which is called a fro or a fromard um, and it's used in a sort of a forward action, um, sort of backwards and forwards. I think possibly the, the expression to and fro might have been uh, come from this sort of activity. Uh, this one I made out of a piece of a lorry spring and uh, this is an original, quite an old one, about a hundred years old, which I've, I use this one as well. The big one for getting into the timber in the big poles and this one when the work is a bit more delicate. The other tool I'd need is a, a mallet. Sorry about all the tape, it's about seeing it's a last of this, I have to make another one, but that's had plenty of action. And we put the fro across the end of the pole in the middle, we tap it in Now that split that you can see, we've got to keep that split running down the middle. Um, a split will always run to the wood under pressure. So if I pull sort of towards myself on the throw handle, the split will run this way. If I want the split to run that way, away from me, then I'll turn the wood over and again pull towards me, assisted by the jaws of the cleaving brake. So when I'm cleaving, I'm continually watching the split. Now the split at the moment is running off towards the camera. There, it's running off towards you. So I want the split to come this way. So I'm going to take the throw out, turn the wood over, put a bit of pressure down, we're just gently but firmly. The split has run back to the middle. You can see it was going off and now it's coming back. Not making excuses, but this piece of wood is very dry. It's over a year old since it was harvested and it sounds a bit, uh, sounds a bit dry, but it's going. It's a lovely wood to cleave. Sweet chestnut. So I'm putting pressure on the throw handle in the jaws of the cleaving brake. And there we are into two pieces. And that, what, that is what we call the splitting image. What we've got there is the splitting image. That needs to be split again. Now I could try and be clever and get um, three handles out of that, but that's asking rather a lot. You'd have to be spot on with the cleaving. If it ran out anywhere, then you'd finish up with nothing much. So I'm just going to play safe and split that in half. Start it off down the middle. Splits wanting to run towards me at the moment, so I want the split to go that way. So I'm going to turn it over and press down on the throw. That was brought it back to the middle. So we're running down the middle. So we've got 
that one's useful well they're both useful that's going to make a handle right so we'll get a handle out of that and we'll get a handle out of that so that's over 12 months old so it's very dry um, when it's freshly cut it splits so easily it's in incredibly easy to split but now it's dried uh, life is a little more difficult this, that's go, this piece that's going to make a handle uh, needs to be exactly the right length and uh, this is just a piece that's uh, uh, a pattern rod and uh, on it it says that the handle should be um, 42 inches long can't remember what that is in centimetres but uh, 42 inches long and uh, I've just got a simple measuring device on the end of the cleaving brake here so if I'm going to cut this one to length I would look at it and say well what do I, what do I want to get rid of well I want to get rid of that knot I don't want to measure from that end and then find I've still got that knot, knot just there and there's a bit there I could get rid of so I'm going to clean that end up I'll clean that end up and use the cleaving brake as a, as a sawing horse now so I just trap the wood in there press down and I've got it secure for sawing so that ends clean I then put it on the the measure which is on the end here up to the bottom of that piece of silver tape I've got there and just mark it so I'm getting rid of that knotty bit Nothing is more annoying than cutting a piece to length and thinking, well, why did I leave that piece on there? I should have got rid of that. So that's exactly the right length for a handle. Right, we'll have a go at splitting this piece of willow down. For the two-gallon truck, you need seven boards. And we call that one a centre board. This one is a second. This one is a second. That one is a third, that one is a third, and that is a side, and that's a side. Now it would be nice to get seven boards out of one log, but the chances of that would be a, a, a miracle, so you'd need several pieces. So seven boards, and they're all shaped slightly differently depending on where they go into the curvature of the basket. This looks quite a clean piece. When I say clean, not too many knots and branches. What we don't want, a lot of knots. Now I'm going to take the bark off that so I can see where the splits are running. Otherwise they'll be hidden. So I'm coming onto the block here. And I'm just going to take off with an axe. A word about the axe. Um, the axe is flat on one side and beveled on the other so it's what's called a side axe and um, it enables you to use it like a chisel really as a shaping axe if this was just a normal sort of chopping axe sharpened on both sides it would tend to bounce away from the work so all country craftsmen that were involved in sort of rural wood, woodcraft would all use a side axe. And you can still get them new now, they're being made new again because of the interest from people in this type of uh, country craft work. <coughs> and if you've got a bit of a headache coming on, have a chew. Because from willow bark you get aspirin. Salix, salicin, aspirin. But it takes your mind off the headache because it tastes so awful. Right, I'm going to split this in half. We generally go into halves and halves again. So 
So I can see the split more clearly now the bark's out of the way. And that piece can go in half again. Now that piece, I'd be very lucky really to split that in half again. I'd finish up with nothing. So I'm going to keep that piece and that will make a, a sideboard. There were the sides. So I'll be able to get a sideboard out of that. Again, I'd be hard pressed myself to split that again. So I'm going to just play safe and that would make quite a nice centre board. It's nice straight grain, no knots. Bit of a crack at the end where the wet's got in. Just checking it against a pattern. This is a, a pattern for a centre. And uh, I'd lose those splits because the actual length allows for a bit of waste. So I'd probably uh, save that as a centre board. And that was just half of that log. I can hear the cameraman whispering to himself, that is amazing. Perhaps not. The pieces we got here came out of that one willow pole. And there's one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve pieces. Um, hopefully a lot of those will be finished as boards that will go into a, into a truck. Right, so there's our pattern. This is a side, so just... Refreshing your memory, there's seven boards in the truck. This piece would make a side, right? And there's the pattern for the side. But I'm not sticking, you know, too closely to the sizes. Sometimes they can be a bit wider, sometimes a bit narrower. So you may even have nine boards in the truck if you're rather shorter material and they're all tending to come out a bit narrow. So you've got to be sort of flexible a bit. But long as they're, they're sort of long enough to get rid of any splits and uh, bits at the end. Now that's, that's just about right. So I'm going to use my side axe to just get a straight edge down there. Um, and then I'll start putting a bit of a bit of shaping in with this just to remind me where the shaping is going to come. So we've, we're getting the sort of shape of that board. Now I can take a bit off the back here. What we're aiming for is a board that is about, uh, well in inches, about an eighth of an inch in the middle down to about a sixteenth at the end, or in millimetres, you know, three to four millimetres and a couple of millimetres at that end. The thing you've got to remember is that this board has got to be sort of thin and flexible. So the boards are prepared on the block, just, uh, just with the side axe. The rims and the handles will be prepared in just the same way. When we're preparing the sweet chestnut we're always careful not to damage the bark by scuffing it off because the, the bark shows on the finished basket and you want the, it's quite a feature of the sweet chestnut bark. Um, so this is the, the inner section of the pole and uh, they can be saved for the chestnut paling fencing or making tent pegs. With a thicker material. So nothing is wasted and eventually the shavings that you finish up with they all get used as fire lighting like the pile that we've got over there. So this is a handle uh, which I'm going to uh, axe down roughly to size and uh, if you're wanting to chop off material you don't just start in the middle hacking away because the split will probably run out and ruin the piece of wood. In order to be under control you just put, make lots of small chips. Like that and then knock those chips off. 
knock them off. So you've got control of the depth, right? Turn that over, go in from the other end. The axe is vertical, the wood is at an angle. You know, it's no good trying to sort of chop in from the side, you're just knocking the wood off the block. Now I'm going to go down quite, quite thin. The more I can take off with the axe at this stage, the better. Now when I get to the middle, it everything sort of springing a bit and bouncing about. It's not so easy. It's easy to cut down here, but here it's more difficult. So I bring it down onto the side of the block, where I've got a flat cut out on the block, so I can chop against the resistance of that. Now you see this that's coming off, you can only really get it off like that by using a side axe, just an ordinary axe would not work. So we're ready for the next stage. The next stage with the, the rim and the handle is to get these smoothed off and exactly to size. So this will go over to the shaving horse and the uh, the board, or the boards, would need to be done on the shaving horse as well. Right, so the next stage is to work on the shaving horse. It's called a horse because you sit on it, but it's not likely to gallop off. And the shaving because you can uh, grip wood in the jaws of the horse there and work on it. And you're, you're sitting comfortably, you've got a cushion here, you've got all the comfort. Um, and I put a leather apron on just to uh, give myself a, a bit of protection, or a bib as it's sometimes called, because I'm using a draw knife, which is razor sharp. And you might think that you could cut yourself there, but you, your arms tend to lock about in that position. Um, but what, what it does do is sometimes you, you don't grip the wood very well and it shoots up and jabs you in the in the stomach and it just gives you a bit of protection there and stops you making holes in your jumper or your shirt or bruising yourself. So uh, got a bit of protection there. Um, now the first thing I would do on this is get one edge straight. So I look at the edge I want to get straight. I want to get rid of a bit of that knot and get rid of that eventually. So I'm going to put the straight edge on there. So I'm just straightening that up. See how convenient it is to hold the wood in the jaws of this horse. Turn it round so I can just finish that off. Just taking a little bit off. Now a, a craftsman who's been doing this all his life would not do this next procedure uh, but I am because I've not been doing these all my life I've only been doing them for 40 years um, and I'm going to run a gauge down from that face that I've just got just a marking gauge set at about 30 millimeters about an inch and a bit just so I've got a line to work to So, so the next thing is to draw a knife down to that line that I've marked. As I said, the old trug makers would be laughing at me doing a, a line, but I like to put a line on so I know where I'm going. Now I can start shaping it down. These two gauges just here, that one's about half an inch, about 13 millimetres, something like that, and that's uh, just a little bit narrower, um, about 10, about a centimetre. And I start by getting it to fit through there, and when it fits through that one, I then get it to fit through this one. About right there. A 
the ends of this have got to be tapered about 12 inches, 15 centimeters, 30 centimeters or so in tapered to the end, both ends, because this has got to be bent round and overlapped in order to make the handle. So it'll look like that. It'll go around this jig, this former. So that has to be tapered, that has to end has to be tapered, so the two will lap together. So we can start putting the taper on when you're satisfied that you're getting it to the size you want. And then I'll just take off that just to tidy that end up. Take it just a chamfer off. Same the other end. Just take that chamfer off there. So when these two come together, it looks nice and tidy. So it's exactly the same procedure with the with the rim, but you're dealing with something. A lot longer and it's a bit more awkward but uh, you still achieve the same result. Now that's almost to the size, it's getting flexible and to smooth it off, to get it really smooth, I tend to scrape it. This is a scraper, it's just a piece of a plane blade, a uh, saw blade, sorry, a, bit of a saw blade in a, a wooden handle and you can the only thing I need to do at this stage is to check that it's going to be bent around this former and this end, one end has to fit in there, that's quite a good fit as it is so that's okay. And then when this is steamed, as we'll do later, and bent round, then you need to be able to put a nail in through that end where it overlaps. So at this stage, I would put a hole with the brad all in this end. So it's there ready when I need it. Because when this piece of wood comes out of the steam box, it's very hot and you've got to work quickly. You can't be stopping and messing about making a hole with the brad all because it will go cold and won't bend so easily. So that piece is ready for steaming and after 20 minutes steaming it'll be bent around this former and nailed to give the shape of the handle. I'm going to go over to the workbench just behind me and in the uh, jaws of the, the bench I'm going to put a, an old jack plane upside down so it acts a bit like a, a Cooper's, a barrel maker's plane. Like that. There's the blade so I can take the piece across the blade the only thing you have to be careful of is you don't plane your fingertips off. Very good for trimming your fingernails so you keep your fingers out of the way So it's got me a nice edge there now so I can see when I'm working on the shaving horse. And also it's an opportunity to get the shape of the board. So I do the same with all of those. Prepare them all to the different sizes, centre board, seconds, thirds, sides. So I've got a nice set ready to soak, ready to go into the into the tub a bit later on. Um, this is the steaming arrangement. The wood has got to be softened so that you can bend it around the jigs, around the formers to get the shape of the handle and the rim. Uh, so we've just got a gas bottle and uh, a kettle and uh, a wooden box that goes over the end. I've got uh, two rims and two handles to go in the box. So we'll slide those, we'll slide those in. and uh, two handles, hopefully we'll be able to get them in. So 
because there's enough there that I can pull on to get them out. Uh, now they've got to be in there for about 20 minutes. So the hot wood, I generally put gloves on for this because you don't want to be going, ooh, ah, you know. So that's where it's going to be very hot. This is a handle paste. The end goes into there. You bend it round against yourself, wrap it round, working as quickly as you can, and then reach for a nail, which I've got handy. Reach for a nail and the hammer and just nail it in. And the rim, the rim will come out hot and we'll go round the rim jig so it'll start in there, bending round, overlapping, and again they stay in there until they're cooled off. And over here we've got um, hot water for the boards um, on a, on a gas, uh, gas ring. Normally I use the stove you know, in the winter to, to heat it up. I'm just going to put a top up a bit more water from the kettle. And uh, the, the iron there is just to act as a weight, just to hold the boards down. And I put the iron in a plastic bag so that the iron doesn't stain the boards. You tend to get a nasty, rusty mark on the boards. So uh, hence the plastic bag around the, around the uh, iron. But they don't have to be in there all that long. In fact, they can, they can stay there as, as long as you like, as long as they soften up so that they will bend. While we're waiting for the steamer to soften the wood, we can make some stands. These are the stands or the feet. As I said, if it's a very big truck, you wouldn't have feet, you just have straps going across to strengthen it. <clears throat> now you could use sawn material, you could whip some sawn stuff down, but they, they never look quite the same as the handmade cleft ones. So I'm going to show you the traditional way of making the, the stands out of a piece of willow. Right, so we bring this onto the shaving horse. <clears throat> along with the pattern. And the first thing I would do is take the bark off. Pretty straight. Now we can work on the sides. Bit of a knot there. It's got to be a demonstration one, perhaps. So we're looking for a sort of triangular shape. So bearing in mind this is going to make the two. I think we could take a bit more of that knot out of there. There it goes. Right, laying the pattern alongside it, I can mark the middle where the it's going to be scalloped out.
just put a bit of chamfering on the ends just to, to always make things look a bit lighter and a little bit more finished. And that can be cut in half. <coughs> Again, using the horse as a, a vice. Chamfer the ends off. And then we'll be rushing inside because our 20 minutes is about up in the steamer. Definitely needs half an hour when the wood's as dry as this. The bark's just cracking a little bit on the corners, but we're pretty well round. Although the bark's come off there. Anyway, you bring it round, put your nail in, nail it up in order to give you the, the handle. Now, although that's gone round there quite well, um, the bark here has come free, but that's no, not a big issue really. Some truck makers deliberately take the bark off and then when the truck is together they stain this whatever colour they want. I would probably put a dark oak stain on or chestnutty type stain just to highlight the, the rim and the, the handle from the boards. Rim coming out now. That one has gone a lot better. Bark's cracked a little bit on that corner, but I can cheat a bit by, when it comes out, I'll put a little bit of glue under there and just put some string around that holds the bark down tight on the corner so it won't spring out again. I don't like having to do that. I feel as if I cheated a bit, but this is one of the problems you get. That's a good corner. And uh, so that's how the, how the rims are made. Right, so here's, here's a, a, a rim that's already, that's been done and successfully gone round the, the former. Uh, that then has to be eased out and a nail put in there and there. When I say nail, they're, they're tacks. Sometimes people use the copper tacks, I use the iron tacks there. So we drive a tack through, brad all in the hole so you don't split the wood and uh, tapping the end over, clenching the end over onto an anvil um, on the bench. So that's our rim. The handle, again, you take off its former. It's already got one nail in. You need to put a second nail in there, brad oiling the hole and then clenching the nail over. So that gives us our rim and our handle. That would have to be nailed over. And then the two have got to go together like that. And this is where you can spend quite a bit of time fiddling about trying to get the, uh, the handle in the middle and you can do it by eye and also getting the, the handle so it's you know exaggerating you don't want the handle going in like that you want the, that part of the handle flat as flat as possible to take that first board so you've got to fiddle about with it sometimes I put a, a clamp on there and on there so that you can adjust it until you're happy with it and then uh, put a nail through, brad all in the hole, put a nail through, holding it there, holding it there, so you've got the frame. Here we're going to start putting things together, putting, assembling the basket. And uh, what I do like to do, I, I perhaps ought to do it when I've finished, but I, I like to put my name stamp on at this point. 
Uh, in fact, this has got H. Manton on, which is Herbert Manton, and my middle name is Herbert, after my grandfather. This was my grandfather's stamp. He used to make golf clubs, <coughs> some of which are above me, up there. And uh, so I'm quite pleased to continue using his, his stamp, which I'll put on the bottom of the feet, H. Manton. So there's a bit of the past there. Easier to do it, better to do it now rather than demolish the trug trying to stamp your name in when you've done. So there the feet stands ready to go on. <clears throat> right, frame, first board to go in is the centre board. So I'll take the centre board out of the hot water. That's feeling nice and hot. <coughs> I've got this sort of plastic jaw on the horse so that it doesn't mark the board so I'm just going to sort of pre-bend the board there in order to start to get a bit of shape. This is where it's important that it's been shaved evenly both ends otherwise you get a bit of a pig in it. So that pre-bends them. Place the board in the centre Press it down to the middle. You don't have to worry too much about the ends at this stage, but it's important to get the, the board in the middle. You don't want the board, the first board, cockeyed like that, otherwise the whole thing's going to be a disaster. So that's the middle. And then you'd all, you always brad all a hole. If you just drive a nail in, you might be lucky and it won't split it, but if you brad all it, it just breaks the fibres of the board. <coughs> and then away you go with a suitable sized tack. I'm using some copper ones. A little short handled hammer that you can get into the basket with. Now you can see that this has got to be symmetrical, so that side's got to come up, so we get a nice sort of shape to the whole thing, and the centre board in the centre. Brad all the hole in the middle. Copper tack. Swing it round. What I can do at this stage, to clench over the end of the tack, is just have a piece of metal on there, so that when you're tapping it in, if the point comes through, it just turns it over. So this side has gone down, so we want to push that side up. Very important to get this first board in tidily. Because all the rest will follow it. And there's nothing more annoying than getting towards the end of the basket and thinking, I wish I'd have spent more time on getting that centre board in, in place. Copper tacks are sort of a bit more decorative, <coughs> a bit more expensive. So there's our centre board in. Now we've got to go for the seconds, making sure we get the right size ones. That's a second. That'll be a second, that can stay in there for a second or two. Give it a bit of shape. And the second has got to overlap the centre board by about nearly an inch, about 20 millimetres or so. Bearing in mind you're going to have to have a third board and a side there. So the second board's ready to go in. Brad all in, in line. 
So we're going through the second and through the centre board. <coughs> Also keeping an eye on this distance there and there. It's very easy for them to get narrow at one end and then you don't notice when you're so busy pushing these boards into place. That one's a little bit on the thick side but we'll carry on now. This will last for 200 years this one will. So when you come to put the thirds in, we've got a curved edge there and pretty well straight there. It's the curved edge that goes in first, right? Not the straight edge. So it's the curved edge goes in first and that helps form the shape of the basket. Put a bit of pressure on your thumbs while you're holding these in place. <coughs> Sideboards to go in. Well, I don't think this one, will, this one will hold water, but I don't think onions will roll out through the gaps. Right, so check there's nothing nasty to catch your clothing on when you're swanning around the garden with it, picking your runner beans. Right, so I just hang the basket over the, the end of the shaving horse and with the bow saw just very carefully I quite like to just take off the the points there just to Get rid of that sharp edge. So all that remains now is for the stands to go on. One to be nailed on there. One to be nailed on there. And obviously when you're nailing them on, just keep checking that you've got them square and not cockeyed. I like to just put it on the, the brad all and then just have a look at the position of it. That looks about right. And the 
second. The other one. If we'd have, if we've made it right, it should sit level when it stands on a flat surface. But I, I deliberately don't knock these outside. I don't knock these outside tacks in too violently because um, if I just try that on a flat surface, theoretically, if we put that down, it shouldn't rock. But it just rocks a little bit, right? So. Um, we can make an adjustment on that. We've got to bring that leg up a bit, that foot up a bit. So if we just give that a tap, it brings it up and it's better. But if I'd have knocked them, that's now sitting level. That one's... No, that's, that's level. But if you knock them right in, you've got, you've got no adjustment. So there are the stands in place. When uh, everything's dry, you can just use a bit of glass paper just to, you know, take off any sort of feathery bits. And the Im important place to put a bit of glass paper on is under there, where your hand goes around here. Check there are no nail ends, no nail ends sticking out that are going to uh, catch up. And that's about it. So there we've got a traditional, what we might call Sussex trug, but in this case Northamptonshire trug, made out of uh, material from Sussex, sweet chestnut from Sussex, willow from Northamptonshire, um, and the whole thing made in a traditional way, cleft sweet chestnut, cleft willow. Um, not many trug makers now actually cleave the material, as Thomas Smith would have done in 1829 and the next few years on from that uh, is now using sawn material and cricket bat willow which is lovely material to use and gets a really nice uh, end product but that's a traditionally made basket and very very strong quite heavy but I tend to make them strong and heavy and uh, that should last as long as you don't leave it out in the garden all winter full of wet soil it would last a lifetime I've come across trugs that are 40 50 years old um, when it's thoroughly dry give it a dose of um, linseed oil or half linseed oil half pure turpentine and uh, that'll soak in keep it preserved for the next generation so there we are <laughs>